Robert Bork of AEI, Sam Peltzman of the University of Chicago, Shelby Steele of San Jose State University, and Donald Kagan of Yale University. Details are available in the brochures in the vestibule. I invite all of you to uh, join us for these lectures. This evening's lecture, Trade and the Environment, the False Conflict, is by Jagdish Bhagwati, Arthur Lehman, Professor of Economics, and professor of political science at Columbia University and a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. AEI's Herb Stein, in a review of Professor Bhagwati's 1989 book, Protectionism, remarked that he is probably the only professor of both economics and political science in the United States and that it probably requires deep understanding of both subjects to make any sense at all out of our trade debate. His dozens of books and hundreds of technical papers have certainly made Professor Bhagwati the nation's leading international trade economist. And in recent years, with his book Protectionism, uh, his more recent work, The World Trading System at Risk, published in 1991 by Princeton, and his frequent essays in the national media, the most recent of which uh, will appear this Thursday in the Wall Street Journal, his work has finally come to the attention of a much wider audience. He is economic policy advisor to the Director General of the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and is known among GATT cognoscenti as the author, although he insists I say partial author, advisor of that body's recent report on trade and the environment, the subject of his lecture this evening. Most important, perhaps, Professor Bhagwati is a card-carrying Clinton Democrat and also an adamant as well as deeply informed free trader. This makes him a rara avis and perhaps even an endangered species. Vice President Gore, please call your office. But one hopes not, and the hope will grow to the degree that he is attended to in this forum and in others. Professor Bhagwati. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris, for those amusing remarks. Uh, <laughs> the titles say Straight in the Environment, the False Conflict, and Chris forgot to put in the question mark after the... Um, now, for those of us who are economists, it's the margin that matters. And even though the question mark looks like a tiny little mark, <laughs> uh, it means everything in this, because I don't believe that the two are, will go together like... Uh, Al Gore believes in his book. Uh, I, I, economists believe in trade-offs, and unfortunately there are trade-offs here as well. Um, I think one of my old Oxford tutors once said that uh, uh, in economics you reach agreement by sharpening your differences, in politics by obfuscating them. Uh, and so I'm going to proceed by sharpening differences and pointing out where, you know, why people arrive at different conclusions and wh where the sort of interface of the two, two possible topics uh, creates problems which need to be resolved. Well, international trade and the environment <clears throat> are arguably the most important issues today on the global economic agenda. The United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, which met in Rio during nearly two weeks ending 14th June last year, was a dramatic demonstration of the urgency and seriousness with which we consider environmental issues today. The swift rise of environmental concerns to the global agenda coincides with the enhanced importance that questions of international trade have now acquired, and which is reflected in the Uruguay round of multilateral trade negotiations. Both trade and environment thus occupy frontally the global agenda in the 1990s. Yet, lest you think that this makes for harmony among the supporters of free trade and better environment, you would be sadly mistaken. Since trade is essentially aimed at exploiting markets, whereas the environment is traditionally outside their purview, since the cause of trade is pursued principally by corporate and multinational interests, while the environment is espoused mainly by non-governmental organizations, which are generally suspicious of these interests, and since trade is an old concern where debate and resolution were defined in ways that made little adjustment for the environment, which is a new concern, the intersection of the two issues has inevitably been marked by friction. <clears throat> 
Indeed, although light may soon be replacing heat on the question, extreme fears have arisen among several environmental groups that trade in the GATT are environment unfriendly. It is not uncommon for environmentalists to talk of catastrophe and of the GATT as Gatzilla, a, a double threat in its gargantuan size and in the threat of the yellow peril associated with anyone who watches Japanese movies about monsters uh, like Godzilla. In turn, pro-trade groups and interests have often reciprocated with similar fears that the environmentalist demands cannot but undermine the possibility of gainful trade. But must the partisans of these two great issues of the 1990s be at loggerheads? I do believe indeed that the conflicts between the two groups are greatly exaggerated. But when the misunderstandings have been cleared up, there do remain areas of conflict between the issues and among different countries whose resolution will require imagination, craftsmanship, and most of all, goodwill. Today, I propose to address just these questions of compatibility and of conflict between the interests of the trading system and of environmental protection. Let me begin by drawing a fundamental distinction of the utmost analytical importance between two classes of problems. One, environmental problems that are intrinsically <coughs> domestic in nature, though they are inter being internationalized for reasons which I shall shortly discuss, and those that are intrinsically international in nature because they inherently involve spillovers across national borders. Thus, if India pollutes a lake that is wholly within its borders, and nobody has even heard of it in the younger generation which doesn't read geography anymore, that is an intrinsically domestic question. If, however, she pollutes a river that flows into Bangladesh, that is an intrinsically international question. So are the well-known problems of acid rain, ozone layer depletion, and global warming. These latter intrinsically international problems of the environment raise questions that interface with the trade questions in a very different and rather complex way from the former intrinsically domestic problems, and I shall come to them very quickly at the end of the lecture. For now, let me address the intrinsically domestic environmental issues, which despite the fact that they are intrinsically domestic, are in fact a source, sources of very fundamental and deep-seated problems that are emerging between the free trade crowd and the environmental crowd. So let me begin with those. A country's solutions to the problems of intrinsically domestic environmental problems should reflect in principle her own resources, her technical know-how, and her own trade-offs between income and pollution of countless varieties. Her solutions should thus be within her own traditional jurisdiction, reflecting all these fundamental parameters. As long as the environmental question is intrinsically domestic, one may then wonder why anyone should object to the conduct of free trade with a country on the ground that her preferred environmental solution makes free trade with her unacceptable. And yet the fact is that they do today. And the objections are directed not merely at free trade, but also at the institutional safeguards and practices as embodied in the GATT, which are designed to ensure the proper functioning of an open multilateral trading system embodying the principles of free trade. So let me tell you what these objections are. They take fundamentally four forms. First, we have the question of what is regarded as, as unfair trade. If you do something different, and especially if you do what appears to be less concerning any one particular industry or sector in the environmental area, that is considered to be tantamount to the lack of level playing fields in our jargon, and therefore amounts to unfair trade by you. Free trade according to this doctrine is then unacceptable as it requires as a precondition fair trade. Next, there is the issue sp specific and endemic to environment of losing one's higher standards. Again, environmentalists fear that if free trade occurs with countries having lower env environmental standards, no matter what the justification for this situation, then the effect will be to lower their own standards. This will follow from the political pressure brought to bear on governments to lower standards in the interest of the survival of their own industry and international competition. Third, environmental, environmentalists also often want to impose their ethical preferences on other nations. Free trade with nations that do not comply with one's preferences, as in the non-use of purse nets and catching tuna, or the leg hole traps and hunting for fur, is then objectionable for one of two reasons. Either trade should be withheld as a sanction to induce 
or coerce acceptance of such preferences by others, or trade should be abandoned even if it has no e effective consequence and might even hurt only oneself simply because of the old moral maxim, one should have no truck with the devil. Finally, many environmentalists consider the trade regulating institutions such as a GATT to be pro-trade and anti-environment because these institutions are regarded as constraining the freedom to pursue even purely domestic environmental objectives. The interests of the environment are seen as being sacrificed when they conflict with those of trade, as they occasionally do and as I shall discuss shortly. I will therefore discuss each of these four contentions in turn. I might add that I will conclude by arguing that some of these arguments do have cogency, whereas others do not, and that some institutional changes in my judgment are in order to bring harmony between environmentalists and the free traders. So let me start with the issue of unfair trade, which is familiar to everybody, certainly in Washington. The objection to free trade when differences in environment regulations make for alleged differences in international competitiveness is probably the most potent one today. There are efforts underway in Congress, for instance, to impose countervailing duties on imports of products made abroad by industries that have lower environmental standards than in the United States by calling it social dumping or environmental dumping and treating the matter as one where the country with lower standards is effectively subsidizing unfairly her production by not meeting the environmental standards of the United States. For instance, Senator Boren of the Senate Finance Committee made a statement on 25th October 1991 proposing precisely such a countervailing duty and there are countless other examples like that. If you've read Vice President Al Gore's book on the environment, there is a section, a small one, but still it's there very distinctly, which in fact endorses this approach uh, equally. These demands altogether ignore the fact, in my view, that the precise choices that a nation makes in intrinsically domestic environmental regulation must reflect her own economic conditions and social preferences. For instance, polluting now, growing faster, and cleaning up later may be more economical for a country. Or for specific environmental choices, a country may prefer to spend on cleanup or prevention in one industry rather than another reflecting her own evaluation of environmental impacts in these different industries. So for instance, if a chemical industry is located in, around one lake and another industry which also pollutes a lake is near another lake, uh, a country like Brazil or any, any country for that matter might decide to pollute one lake rather than another given limited resources because one lake has nobody drinking from it and the other one has a whole lot of poor people drinking for, from it. Therefore, a specific industry which happens to be the, near the lake, which you don't want polluted, uh, will have the environmental regulation. The other one will not. But then we are making comparisons not ac across different industries in the same country, but across industries w b uh, internationally. And that is what's going to create the problem. So the choice which is being made by that specific country reflects its own choices, n even if it values environment as much as we do. So if you could write a preference function or an objective function or a utility function, as economists describe it in jargon, uh, that would show equal attachment to environmental protection. But the outcomes in equilibrium and the choice that results may be very different uh, in terms of where you will see the environmental protection where you won't. Therefore, fundamentally, it is wrong-headed, uh, I mean, it gives economists the shivers, uh, to think of people saying we must have identical standards by industry across countries. It's simply bad economics. And I suspect that is what that infamous memo of Larry Summers was trying to convey, though not in quite the way it should be. Uh, and, you know, it, 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 that is my benign reading of the memo. Uh, but in fact, the realistic meaning of the memo was, was really that it really was badly argued. Uh, and unfortunately, that cost us uh, his position as a council chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. But now he has a seat at the table for G7. So, you know, I don't know whether it's a gain or a loss in terms of private marginal product and social marginal product. Each one will have their views about the rank ordering of um, these two students of mine, uh, Laura Tyson and him. Now, in short, therefore, um, the notion that international standards should be set for all, 
or that the U.S. should have the power to countervail any social dumping it deems to be occurring abroad is ignoring the fact, as I said, that there are legitimate reasons for diversity in environmental regulation across countries. But the complaints and political pressures brought by specific industries about unfair trade by countries with differential and lower environmental standards compared to one's own remains a powerful fact on the political scene nonetheless. They have now become part of the more general case for what we Americans call level playing fields, i.e. competition subject to common rules and handicaps by industry or by sector. Demands for harmonization of all kinds of domestic policies are now growing apace in environment, in labor standards, in competition policy, in technology policy. You could have a string of conferences lasting for days on these subjects because it's propping up in all sorts of things and the structural impediments initiative with Japan there were over 200 items which we were complaining about uh, essentially in the framework uh, of, of harmonization or getting them to be more like us which is the same or another way of saying the same thing now without such harmonization it is increasingly asserted that free trade cannot be fair and countervailing protection becomes necessary and there are many reasons for this trend and I have no time to go into that uh, but in the end, countries are not likely to become clones of each other in domestic objectives and policies, and therefore this poses a real problem to, to free trade, in my opinion. Um, the one reason which I'll sort of simply highlight very quickly, which lies, underlies the trend towards harmonization, in my view, is intensification of competition that the globalized world economy has brought about with industries everywhere increasingly open to competition, thanks precisely to our post-war success in dismantling trade barriers, with multinationals spreading technology freely across countries through direct investments, and with capital more free than ever to move across countries, producers face now the prospect that their competitive advantage is fragile, and that more industries than ever before are what we used to call footloose industries. There is therefore much more sensitivity to any advantage that one's rivals abroad may enjoy in world competition, and a propensity therefore to look over their shoulders to find reasons why a specific advantage they have in international competition is unfair. The notion of unfairness is also attractive to those who seek relief from international competition. If you go to your congresswoman and ask for protection because the competition is tough, it is going to be difficult to get it since most of them have read our books. But if you go to her and say that your successful rival is playing by unfair rules, instead of just ranting and raving about the you know, fact that you're going under, that is just music to protectionist ears. And in the United States in particular, and this is something we foreigners or people who come from you know, other shores, we, we notice this particularly. In the United States in particular, the unfairness notion can take you really far. <laughs> since the economic and social ethos reflects notions of fairness and equality of excess rather than success more than anywhere else that I know of. And in fact, if you compare how the EC reacts to competition from Japan and how we react, you see the difference uh, exactly along the lines I'm suggesting. The EC simply goes ahead and protects. It simply uses anti-dumping procedures and effectively uses them as industrial policy. They make no fuss about it. They don't try and justify it. They just do it, OK? Uh, we make a song and dance about unfairness. You know, the Japanese are behaving in some sort of inscrutable way to you know, compete unfairly with us. We have to convince ourselves that before we hit them, uh, <laughs> right, and protect our chaps in Silicon Valley, et cetera, there's really something unfair is involved from the other side. So this society is hung up quite correctly, in my view, on the fairness notion. And that's why it's a very potent thing coming from Washington. Uh, and it's, it's, it's something which is really played upon when people are in trouble. While, therefore, the unfair trade argument for rejecting free trade with countries with different environmental standards is part of the gen generic and more general demands for harmonization and level playing fields in world trade, particularly on, uh, in Washington, environment whose protection is legitimately a virtue in itself brings to this trend more arguments, all right, which we have to deal with, which also have powerful appeal. And these are the other three arguments that I set forth at the beginning. Chief among them is the fear that competition with the imports and exports in third markets from countries with lower standards will put pressure on domestic industries 
triggering political action by them to lower standards down to the levels of road. The environmental NGOs in the United States and elsewhere have come to see this as a real threat to their goals if free trade is embraced and harmonization up is not imposed simultaneously by coercion on foreign countries like Mexico and the whole range of poor countries. This concern reflects at the global level, the debate within the EC itself, if you know the EC experience, the fear that the common markets, free trade and free capital flows will lead to harmonization down of standards from below and the efforts of many in consequence, particularly in France, to impose harmonization at a higher level of standards from the top. In fact, these concerns now cut across also the effects of free trade and capital flows on the real wages of workers, an issue that became important, as you will recall, in the recent presidential election. The Clinton campaign focused not just on the apparent failure of the Bush administration to revive the economy, something, you know, which is hard to believe now uh, with the recovery. It also made much of the so-called structural problem, which is defined by the stagnation of real wages of the unskilled workers during the 1980s. That was the key statistic which was used uh, to, to, to say that we were in a long-run structural malaise which needed a, a new kind of administration. At least one of the candidates for explaining this phenomenon has been the integration of the world economy and the competition and consequence with poor countries with abundant unskilled labor. I doubt the importance of this explanation myself, though I should hold it dear to my heart since that's a trade theory explanation uh, and I'm a trade theorist. But I don't think there's any real, any real evidence in support of that. But it does have powerful appeal. In fact, some of the attempts, at, uh, in fact, at the last meeting some of us were at, Lester Thoreau announced to the young sort of freshman from in Congress with a great air of discovery that there's something called the factor price equalization theorem, you know, which is really what we teach in the classroom in international. And that's going to screw all the <laughs> uh, unskilled workers in this country, and therefore we need to have a set of policies. Anyway, in fact, some of the attempts at globalizing the higher environmental and labor standards, with the latter un coming uncomfortably close to attempts at also raising wages in the industrial sectors of the poor countries on human rights and labor rights grounds, can be seen or interpreted as indirect ways of trying to reduce the threat to real wages of the unskilled and rich countries from free trade with these countries. But if this explanation is really bought, then we are back to the old concerns that free trade with the poor countries will truly act like free immigration from them. The immigration would directly depress workers' wages, free trade would indirectly do so. Interestingly, in the animated British debate prior to the passage of the 1905 Immigration Act in Britain, which was the first national act of establishing national quotas on, on immigrants, the free traders were also free immigrationists, and the protectionists were also for restrictions on immigration. They saw the symmetry very clearly in the political debate. Immigration was even described as free trade in paupers. If I may complete this thought, the growing sentiment that free trade with the poor countries will increasingly depress rich countries' real wages should eventually lead to not protection which few would want, but palliatives like the imposition of harmonized up environment and labor standards in the hope that they'll raise the cost of unskilled labor abroad, and attempts, however feeble, at restricting capital outflows to these countries. But I also predict that we will witness increasingly attempts at encouraging and even forcing population control in these poor countries. Let me return, however, to the environmental question and turn now to the third environmental objection to free trade. Behind the environmental argument against free trade is also the zeal to impose one's own particular ethical preferences on other communities and nations. But the use of state power in the shape of trade sanctions and restrictions so as to force others into accepting one's own specific choice of ethical concerns seems to me to be wholly inappropriate. And let me explain because it is a complex argument. For instance, we Americans are particularly touched by dolphins being caught cruelly in purse sign nets and fishing tuna. But I wonder when I see on television an interview with the man who brought this to national attention by filming the dolphins in distress, he's, I think, eating fish in the wilds. If we have our dolphins, the Indians have their sacred cows. Animal rights activists object to our slaughterhouses. Others may see in Robert Redford's 
magical moments when he fishes in a river, runs through it, not his rapport with nature, but his violation of it, with cruelty to the fish that twists and turns, writhing in agony. The moral militancy that motivates some of the environmental NGOs seeking unilaterally imposed traits or sanctions on others who do not share their particular preferences or values has begun to turn off even other NGOs, particularly in the poor countries that see eco-imperialism when the strong nations use trade power to force their preferred specific values on the weaker nations. But the equally autonomous values of the weaker nations cannot be forced upon the stronger nations thus. These NGOs deny that the NGOs of the strong nations have monopoly on virtue. The GATT report on trade and the environment, which uh, uh, Chris Timuth referred to uh, last year, drew attention not to this asymmetry of effective enforceability of the values of the North versus the equally autonomous values of the South owing to differential power. Rather, it advanced the more general slippery slope scenario that if any country could suspend another's trading rights and products produced in an unacceptable fashion, when no international physical spillovers were involved but only other values were at stake, the result was likely to be a proliferation of trade restrictions without any discipline or restraint. It was difficult to think of a way to effectively contain the cross-border assertion of priorities. You would soon be living in a Galbraithian world where each one thinks his values are better than somebody else's and the other guy thinks exactly symmetrically towards your values. So you get an intransitive world, basically. These views concerning unilateralism to impose one's values on others acquire yet greater cogency when we recognize that there are alternative ways in which one's values can be indulged and propagated. Most important, if your values are good, as with human rights, they will tend to spread because of their intrinsic appeal. Mahatma Gandhi's idea of nonviolence spread far and wide, not because India had economic power to force it on others, or because Western NGOs urged trade sanctions against their own nations to canvas its adoption. It spread simply because of its inherent and powerful moral attractiveness. Moreover, there are alternative private options available to propagate your particular ethical preferences if greater activism is desired. Nothing today prescribes NGOs in the United States or anywhere, for example, from financing NGOs in Mexico into bringing pressure on the Mexican government to change its attitude on purse sign nets, thus changing the balance of forces in Mexico away from more productive tuna fishing that benefits Mexico economically and towards dolphin safe fishing that benefits the dolphins in the Eastern Pacific instead. Then again, voluntary private boycotts can be a potent instrument as well. A long-standing tradition permits such private boycotts, provided labeling requirements that permit consumers to make the choices in the marketplace between, say, dolphin safe and dolphin unsafe tuna are allowed. These boycotts do provide an option to dolphin agita uh, agitated activists. The unilateral governmental imposition of trade sanctions against other nations simply with a view to getting them to accept one's own specific idiosyncratic value preferences seems therefore to me to be uh, inadvisable on three principal grounds. One, it is essentially intransitive, with each nation able to say its specific values are better than another's. It thus creates the potential for chaotic spread of trade restrictions based on self-righteousness, compounded by a likely encouragement of the process by protectionists. Two, it is inherently asymmetric towards poor nations with less economic clout, implying that the economically strong nations are also morally superior and their governments must not be constrained by multilateral rules from coercing others into conversion. And three, there are good alternative private options that can be used to create a multilateral consensus of shared values based not on the sword but on precept, example, and even private retribution via boycotts. It is noteworthy that these arguments are spreading within the international community. Thus, Steve Charnowitz, a good environmentalist friend of mine, has recently complained, actually, that the GATS campaign against unilateralism is having some impact. Uh, I don't think the Clinton administration is quite aware of that fact. Uh, earlier this year, the UN Conference on Trade and Development adopted a resolution stating that unilateral actions to deal with environmental challenges outside the jurisdiction of the importing country should be avoided. The Rio Declaration repeats this statement. I will proceed to argue later that some ways will have to be found to accommodate less than universal environmental agreements that use well-defined trade restrictions and sanctions.
when the problems involve physical spillovers across countries as with global warming. But I have little doubt in my mind that unilateral actions designed simply to impose values on others through the use of trade sanctions are unwise. I'm therefore only delighted that this view is gaining ground. But something more needs to be said before I leave this subject. Uh, suppose that your intention in denying Mexico access to the U.S. market is not to change Mexican fishing of tuna in a dolphin safe direction, so you're not a consequentialist in ethical terms, but it's simply to avoid eating a defiled product, right, which is caught in a way which you morally disapprove of. So it's an absolute value that you have, and that defends your moral values. Should you then be forced by the GATT or somebody into consuming that tuna uh, simply because free trade rules are set up that way. That was, I mean, I certainly would reject that option if that was, a, but, that, but that is not really a valid way of looking at it. Nothing in current or prospective GATT rules forces you into this offensive option. For you could certainly compensate the country whose trading rights are being denied or suspended by either offering other concessions or in the odd manner of GATT procedures by having the other country withdraw some equivalent concessions of her own or better still in a manner which I prefer, through cash compensation for the gains from trade element lost by the other country, which would not amount to, to a great number. Confronted by this argument, some environmentalists are deeply offended. Why should we have to pay for our principles? Sounds right. But the answer is that is a small price to pay if the alternative of unilateralism has the many drawbacks which were noted by me, and if you buy that, that these are really drawbacks. If it is right in the Christian tradition to buy indulgences to pay for one's vice, perhaps one should not object to a proposal to pay for one's virtue. At least the former is for personal gain, the latter for social gain, again, if you buy my arguments. F finally, another issue, and I think this is probably in my judgment the most compelling one, environmentalists are also worried with a little more cogency about the roadblocks that current and prospective GATT rules can pose for environmental regulations and standards aimed entirely at domestic uh, jurisdiction-defined production and consumption decisions, matters as I, you know, which are conventionally entirely within our jurisdiction. Now, as long as these rules are applied without discrimination between domestic and foreign suppliers, and among different, without discrimination you know, against foreign suppliers, there's really little that GATT rules can do to prevent a country from doing anything that it wants to do. For domestic conservation, safety, and health reasons, there's even an Article 20B and 20G under which you can even undertake selective discriminatory actions. So it has been allowed for in the original design of the, of the GATT. So if you insist on safety belts or airbags in cars, you can impose them on cars as long as both imports from all sources and domestic production are symmetrically, identically treated. So also for requiring catalytic converters to reduce environmentally harmful emissions. So really there's no problem. The most significant, and, and I do create, you know, raise the problem. The most significant and contentious conceptual question that does arise when you, uh, is when you have a rule that says that consumption from any source of a product will be restricted if the product is produced using a process you disapprove of, all right? Uh, objecting to a process used in a foreign or strictly non-domestic, because there are the commons as well, which is nobody's jurisdiction. So strictly non-domestic jurisdiction is under GATT rulings as of today, not acceptable. There are two types of such process-related problems or, or, uh, that we, can, we need to distinguish. One where the process used is the one I was describing earlier because of values we are objecting to it, purse sign nets, leg hole traps, and a variety of chicken batteries, and so on and so forth. Two, where the process use is objected to because it creates cross-border physical spillovers like acid rain or global warming. I've already indicated the reasons why I find the first lot <laughs> sensible to, to, to rule out uh, process-related objections and. Uh, leading to suspension of somebody else's trading rights. But I shall go on to argue that when it comes to physical spillovers, this, that rule doesn't really make much sense, and we definitely need to ha have to worry about how to modify existing practice and thinking up until this date, until environmental problems were discovered, to adjust this rule, because it doesn't make sense in my judgment at all when physical harm is being done to oneself uh, 
by somebody else doing something, and this has become strictly a matter of, you know, one's senses rather than one's sensibility, all right? Uh, now, leaving this thorny question aside, which is going to be the big one, <laughs> um, you still have problems, because it would appear that the GATT rules should have no problems because, because of what I said, that you can do virtually anything you want as long as you don't discriminate. But that's true only at a very broad level. There are, in fact, problems. And th it's important to understand them because that's where, again, a number of changes, accommodations uh, will be necessary to satisfy or reconcile people with opposed points of view. And I just want to spend a tiny bit of time on that, about 10 minutes on that. The problems come from three different directions. One is, it's perfectly possible that in reality, and while a regulatory objective is kosher, all right, on your part, it is a set, you know, it's something related to, to the environment, the intention may be actually to discriminate against imports, all right? So you're distinguishing between intention and the, the apparent superficial uh, nature of that objective, okay? This, I mean, I'll just give you a couple of examples from the field. Two, even if the intention is truly to reach the stated objective, re regulatory objective in relation to environment by, by a particular country, the, there may be alternative ways of reaching that, and then you may say that pick the one which happens to harm or disrupt somebody else's trade the least. If you can find such multiple <laughs> ways of achieving the same objective, that'd be wonderful, you know, but then you'd rank order them and say, look, both objectives are important, more trade and more, uh, <laughs> and, and reaching the environmental goals. So if you have uh, uh, an array of choices possible, uh, you, sh you may want to then have a rule about which one you pick, and the country may pick the one which does disrupt trade most, wittingly or unwittingly, so that becomes an issue. And finally, particularly in relation to safety and health standards, as with uh, phytosanitary standards relating to, to, to um, flora, there have been increasing demands for science tests, uh, and this is something Ms. Browner is dealing with right now in relation to those 35 pesticides, as you remember. Uh, these scientific tests, increasingly people are demanding that as a precondition for the imposition of such standards. So as again to make these palatable to other trading nations, and in fact even to your own industry, um, who might see the resulting loss of markets as otherwise unreasonable. Now these are the three most contentious issues today, uh, even on the domestic jurisdiction issues, um, because the trading rules at the GATT have been defined by trading interests, right? People who are interested in trade, and who then work through the governments and then go ahead and make up rules where uh, you're trying to protect the trading side. Nobody, there was no environmental NGO or anybody for that matter or environmental concern on the part of governments debating on defining these rules of the GATT to deal with these three types of issues, uh, and therefore that's where the problem is really coming from, uh, that the trade-offs, etc., may need to be pulled a little bit to his environmental side, away from decisions which were taken basically on the, uh, to arrive at reasonably satisfactory conclusions from the point of view of maintaining uh, trade and maintaining production and so on. So, so it's the economic interest and narrowly defined which used to be looked after. So that's, so let me say a little bit more concretely about these three issues so you see exactly how these questions arise and where some accommodation will have to be found to accommodate the environmentalist concerns, in my view. Now economists have, let me start with the intention issue which I discussed. Now economists have long recognized the intention issue. Thus, we econo international economists regale our students uh, with an example <coughs> which was provided by Gottfried Habler, who is unfortunately not here today, uh, his example of the provision in the German tariff dating from 1902 and valid decades later, uh, much like our minivan uh, tariff, um, which was clearly meant <coughs> to apply only to Switzerland and Austria. It related to, and I'm quoting now, brown, and this must have been to do with import of cheese made by cow, or you know, from cows, but relating to, and quote, brown or dappled cows reared at a level of at least 300 meters above the sea and passing 
at, at least one month and every summer at a height of at least 800 meters, end of quote. Now, the intention is pretty clear here, right? <laughs> we don't need a dispute settlement panel to <laughs> decide on this one. Within the environmental field, we were taken for a ride by Western Ontario. Uh, the, an example is the United States being the grief party, <coughs> uh, where the Canadian province, Ontario's 10% tax on beer cans, but not bottles, was uh, defended on environmental grounds. Now, even if the United States did not challenge the objective of restraining the use of cans, which is raising a different level of, uh, of the issue, they could legitimately note that the law was likely to have been motivated by the desire to discriminate against foreign beer supplies who, unlike local rivals, predominantly use cans rather than bottles, combined tellingly with the fact that the use of cans for other products, such as soups and juices where Ontario producers would have been affected, was not prescribed. Now, that again, you see, is a, is a fairly clear statement of intention. We won on that. It is hard to see if an environmentalist objects, I would say it's not reasonable, but it is hard to see how a good open trading system cannot permit member countries to examine the bona fides of environmental and other regulations in this way. You would have to, uh, because it's so easy to manipulate the system. And somebody has to sit in judgment. I mean, he may not be God, but you know, he's got to come to term, you know, somehow decide on ev every specific issue that comes up uh, in this regard. So the GATT dispute settlement mechanism can be improved on this one as well in the direction of greater transparency, uh, but it is sufficiently objective in my judgment and neutral between contracting parties. You lose some, you gain some, or you win some. And I think the, this is not something where I personally feel uh, environmentalists have any great uh, standing to, to, to make life miserable for us free traders, uh, frankly. I mean, this is not a, I mean, they have to understand that these issues happen. And somebody, preferably a neutral body like the GATT, has to decide. It can't be left to national procedures, in my judgment, no matter how neutral we, we hope to make them. Two, and I come to this alternative measures issue now. The more, the more difficult issue is really the question of judging between alternative views, alternative measures. And this is a very tough one. Um, so um, there are many cases on this one as well. So let me just sort of s go straight to the question that it's hard to imagine any specific environmental objective which could be met by, I mean, identically met, you know, in the sort of strict sense, by two or three or five different policy measures. Like even labeling requirements, right, to, to say, look, we are going to, uh, to make sure that dolphin unsafe will be put down there, and therefore consumers will be able to discriminate against that as if it was like being prohibited, but you know, you're having consumer choice and this will disrupt Mexican trade less. So, so if you put that up, you still have to contend with the fact that people don't read labels, all right? or if they read them, they discount them, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, you, you may even decide not to bother about it on the ground that other people don't bother about it. Therefore, it may even be rational for you uh, not to do something because you think nobody else is going to do it, right? And therefore, nobody will do it. This is a free rider problem, basically. So if people say, look, labeling is not, a, not really satisfactory, I have, you know, I have to admit that. I mean, it's not the same thing as simply prohibiting. They import or something. So you will never really, in, in, in my judgment, ever get the problem defined uh, in a way where you're really able very quickly and unambiguously to say one particular measure is consistent with the same outcome on the object, environmental objective is, in fact, less disruptive of trade, and therefore we should choose that one. In reality, any court, like the EC court, uh, has been sitting on these issues. Within the EC, there have been cases of this kind. They have to worry about trade-offs, essentially. I mean, what are you sacrificing a bit more, and you know, what are you? So like when, when you're doing labeling, you, 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 you say, OK, you won't achieve the target as much, all right, of restricting dolphin unsafe tuna. Uh, but on the other hand, you will disrupt trade far less, all right, and the Mexico is trading. So there is a trade-off involved. And this is where the environmentalists have a problem, because the dispute settlement panels and the whole tradition of the GATT is to discount 
I mean, they've never really worried about the, these environmental concerns because, as I pointed out, it's not been part of the deal. I mean, it's not something, it's a new concern. And therefore, the weights which implicitly judges who are human, I come from a legal family, and you know, they're very human, uh, uh, and uh, they reflect the, the, the mores and so on in which they grow up to. So it's clear that the dispute settlement panels are likely to attach more weight I would say, I haven't studied this, but it seems like a good prior to me, uh, and certainly not a result of paranoia on the part of environmentalists at all. Uh, and so I think you would then have more weight being attached to the trade side uh, and less to the trade-off on the, on the other side. Therefore, I think when the environmentalists say, look, we should have more representation, uh, more transparency, the ability to have standing, to be able to point out these problems, then I, it seems to me like a, a reasonable concern. I would, of course, open up the GATT panels also to consumer and other interests. Like, I mean, on the dolphin case, if we were going up, we would, I would like to hear from the Mexican fishermen uh, as well as to how they feel about it, you know, what's the level of their poverty which is being going to be impacted. Uh, so that we put the uh, human side against the dolphin side, you know, and so may maybe there's something uh, like a general interest, which is not just environmental interest, there are other general interests, uh, which are also not taken into account uh, in many of these processes. But in any case, environmentalists here have a good point in my judgment. Finally, let me talk about the scientific test issue, and that is in fact a very complex one, is to, in my judgment, the answer is straightforward, but it's disputed, <laughs> heavily disputed by, by people um, everywhere. So the Clinton administration right now is having to battle that very clearly. Uh, as I said last week, Ms. Browner had to get into this issue very clearly. So the scientific issue is best illustrated, let me give you an example, by, by the EC-US conflict on European communities' prescription of hormone-fed beef. And there was a classic case a few years ago. In this instance, the U.S. beef producers that used hormones and the biotech industry that had invented and now produced the hormones were pitted against what they considered to be a wholly unscientific fear of hormone-fed beef. The U.S. went to the length of trade retaliation under Section 301. The EC in the end did not counter retaliate, and the matter was not taken up to, to the GATT dispute settlement process for adjudication with both the EC ban and the U.S. retaliation continuing in place. Given the high probability that a scientific test criterion would have been required by a GATT dispute settlement panel, it is likely that the EC would have lost the case. But the case was an early warning sign of the tension between commercial and environmental interests on this specific issue. Because environmentalists are typically more sensitive to risks of this kind. And the rest of the world <laughs> doesn't seem to be as much, and therefore there is a tension here. So now, admittedly, even hard science is not hard enough most of the time. I mean, it's, in some levels, there's nothing like hard science, right? You're continuously changing hard science as well. But at any one point of time, it is hard, okay? Uh, I mean, that's the latest scientific know-how. Again, even if scientists were agreed on measuring the risk from any event or act of consumption or production, the subjective reaction of different people to the objective risk may vary greatly and in fact does. It is tempting then to say, let any regulation pass because that's how the people feel and that they ought to have autonomy. But we are back then to the slippery slope scenario. <laughs> uh, without the restraining hand of current science, the itch to indulge anything that you know, is remotely worried about by people could be overwhelming, and that could be very disruptive of trade. And we ourselves have been very much against this, like on the hormone-fed beef issue. The solution may then well be again. I mean, if I'm thinking of how to resolve this problem in an <laughs> accommodating fashion, the solution may well be to institutionalize what in effect happened with the hormone-fed beef case, the de facto outcome. First, have the scientific test, all right? And if you lose, you lose, right? Um, if you don't want, to, uh, if if you still want to continue with the thing, as the EC implicitly decided to continue by not going for a scientific test, which it would tend to lose, and if you do not wish to change your regulation or standard, then you pay up. They accepted our our uh, retribution. 
right? Our punishment, which is actually punishing ourselves because th this is a crazy way the system is set up. That, you know, if you, if you deny somebody else's trading rights and retribution for their denial of your trading rights on hormone-fed beef, which means you're really shooting yourself in the foot because somebody else has shot himself and you into the, uh, you know, in the other foot. So uh, it, it really is a crazy way the system is set up. But, but that's another story, you know, in, in a trade theory class or, or because there's no hope of changing the institution on this one. Um, but you then pay up, basically, in one form or another, or you shift, except the fact that, you know, you won't pass the scientific test, that you really cannot suspend uh, U.S.'s trading rights on this, shift to another mechanism like uh, labeling, which was suggested by us to the Europeans, saying just label beef as hormone-fed beef but keep our excess to your markets open, and then agitate against it, you know, have wo organized voluntary boycotts, whatever you want. But then in that case, you are choosing a less trade disruptive option. So all of these are possibilities, and in de facto, the EC preferred to keep the thing on, pay up, which is really the solution I prefer, <laughs> even for the values case. And that was a de facto outcome, and in many cases, people will be inclined to do that rather than push for a scientific test. But a scientific test has to be there in my judgment because I do not see any particular way out of it if you're going to avoid the, the slippery slope. Let me f just say uh, very briefly what the issues are when it comes to physical spillovers and conclude, because uh, I've gone on a bit too long, I think. The, the physical spillovers, in my view, I mean, they're a very complex phenomenon. I just have time for a few remarks. Um, this take, they raise more complicated issues, which will require more drastic changing of the way we do the GATT uh, phenomenon. Take the simplest example where I create acid rain for you, all right, or for, and for myself as well. All right? So if you're in trade with me, and if I'm not undertaking the first best measure of taxing for this, this externality or this unfortunate negative spillover, I can't think of a nice word, English word, I mean, they're all horrible, long words. Um, but negative externalities or, you know, bad spillovers for Canada, for example, from our own acid rain activity, that then, if I'm not doing anything about it directly, then Canada is being hurt by the acid rain, okay? Then it may very well decide that, look, the only thing that I have within my own jurisdiction, the only policy instrument that I have, is to say, okay, I will stop importing or reduce the import of whatever it is that is being used, the product that is using the process, which is creating the acid rain. It's not the best way to get at it, but it's the only thing within my jurisdiction. It's the best thing within my jurisdiction. So I lose the gains from trade because I'm restricting trade, right? Back to the economics 101. And it's not a good thing. But then, because that reduces the level of activity and therefore the fallout of creation and therefore the fallout of acid rain, uh, I have a trade-off, right? And then uh, I'm, I may be better off and then I may be able to do this. Now, when you say that the no process-related measure should be allowed, uh, which is a dolphin tuna panel finding, which is a jurisprudence of the GATT over a number of years, uh, when it sounds quite sensible, as I said, um, it doesn't sound sensible to me, at least in this context, where, in fact, the United States, I mean, you could switch it around and make it Canada hurting us, uh, but it, it sort of grew up in the context of Canada complaining to us, as I rec recall. It's also within the EC context, the same issue comes up. There you have, therefore, in my judgment, a need to examine the issue, like do we really permit this sort of thing? How do we do it? What are the... I don't have any pat answers because that's what we've got to work on for the next round if this one closes, uh, right? Because this is the kind of issue where I think the normal moral judgment or the sort of the sense that you have of what is, what should be done, what should or what should be pros proscribed and what should not be, seems to me to to get find me on the side of uh, permitting intervention rather, you know, of a kind and suspending the rights of the other country because it's physically violating, uh, in a, now it raises the question of the science test and everything. All the things which I raised before will resurrect themselves, okay? Uh, <laughs> there's no way out of those, as I said, with, you know, you can only have 
reasonable <laughs> accommodation with goodwill, procedures which where people will treat as fair even if they go against their own sense of what, the, what was right in a specific case. You just have to take it. Now, this example itself was an easy one. I mean, I was thinking of two, two country examples. But if you have a number of countries emitting, say, carbon and you know, endangering the planet, and then you get into problems of uh, free riders and so on. And you really have to worry about people, again, having different evaluations of the risks. But you also have an equity come efficiency problem. And the efficiency problem is, of, is the one which came up in CO2 uh, discussions. Because while the developing countries were being presented as making great demands on us, and being ten horn dictators and consequence and so on in Evans Novak columns and so on. I mean that really was cockeyed, I mean, from the point of view of the actual economics of the issue, because when we were, when we say that if you have to reduce carbon dioxide emissions by a certain amount for the world as a whole, it is true that the opportunity cost of doing that through you know, restricting the cutting down of rainforests, etc. In poor countries, poor countries have low opportunity costs generally. Uh, for almost anything you may want to do, uh, and particularly in relation to rainforests, that would be that's particularly so compared to cutting down gas emissions and putting in catalytic converters and all the very heavily capital-intensive things in our advanced countries. Then you have an efficient solution, which may require that the entire adjustment <laughs> be carried out, all right, in terms of minimizing global opportunity cost, all right, the global real cost. It should all be done by Brazil and Argentina and India and so on. Fine. And that's an efficient solution, correct? But that's, that has nothing to do with equity, all right? I mean, if you simply said those guys have to do it all because that's where it's cheapest, and then you're not happy, all right? You don't make any uh, uh, um, transfers uh, to them for, for doing such a thing, which is a separate equity issue. Then it begins to look a little odd, all right? And this is the same problem. I mean, free trade is efficient. But it doesn't say anything about income distribution, right? I mean, within the country and between countries. So uh, you do have to worry about those issues. And I think that was a problem that was bothering the more sensible among the developing countries. That the, if you pose the problem in terms of cost minimization, which a lot of people were doing, then it tended to transfer the action to <laughs> of doing it, not to the ones who were putting out the most in terms of t you know, taking away the, this particular valuable resource of the global common. But to those where <laughs> who might have been doing very little, but in fact, that was the area where the cost of doing, you know, reducing the, 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 uh, the utilization of the commons uh, was, in fact, the least. So you have problems which are additional to the domestic jurisdiction issue. You do have problems of satisfying countries that the solutions you're proposing are equitable, uh, efficient, aside from these intentions, science tests, alternative measures, and all that stuff, OK? And so you get another range of problems. And this is where I think it simply reinforces my preference for multilateral solutions, which is that if there are multilateral solutions where it is your job to try and convince people that a, a solution is fair, uh, to all the participants, that, and also hopefully that it's also efficient. Uh, if you go through those procedures, rather than unilaterally decide what you ought to do, you're right, w or what someone else ought to do, or you deprive their rights uh, to export timber to you, uh, something Netherlands, for instance, has been toying with that idea of uh, preventing imports of uh, logs from Indonesia. It's a, there, I mean, Netherlands, which is a fine country like us, I mean, still. Uh, I mean, it's taking a specific view of the situation. It is not really looking at a total solution to an environmental problem, which is efficient and equitable. How one, I mean, all I can say is that if you have a multilateral format, you're un under obligation, more or less, to persuade. Persuasion requires that some sort of fairness will emerge from the, but if you use the clout, you can be almost guaranteed that you won't be fair, because altruism doesn't come naturally in international uh, trade matters, in my judgment. I mean, if you, I started out doing economics as an altruistic person and been, you know, had a benign view of government policy. And as soon as I start, shifted from theory to doing trade policy, I mean, I suddenly became a great cynic, and I still am, <laughs> uh, on you know, what can be accomplished, because it's an uphill struggle to try and get trade policy to, to reflect uh, <laughs> 
sort of more sensible, you know, principles, objectives, and so on. And the problem about unilateralism, which I think is coming back onto the scene here uh, in other contexts, uh, out of impatience, uh, a sense that other countries are, you know, doing us in. All of that, I think, feeds into this environmental way of doing things also sometimes, which is that if you're too impatient, if you convince the other guys they're doing something that's really, you know, uh, cheating, like non-level playing fields and so on, and we become the judge and the jury, and we are the ones with the clout. Uh, it's very easy then to fall into a pattern where we will f get into unilateralism. And in fact, my worry is not that when you modify the GATT or whatever institutions that you have to allow for multilateral disciplines to be imposed, like if, a major, if more than 20 countries undertake to do something, then you're allowed to suspend a, uh, another country's trading rights at the GATT. If you, if you start even thinking in those terms, guess who is going to be objecting to it? Our country, not the poor ones particularly, because we are wedded to unilateralism. We don't want those constraints because, but, I mean, we would have had, we would have liked those constraints 10 years ago when we were in a multilateral mode or even two years ago. <laughs> uh, but not in uh, the current administration and the advisors seem to me to be very much unilateralists. Uh, and once you've sort of, uh, like we have a saying in, in, in India that, you know, once the tiger has tasted blood, is, you, you better watch out. Uh, and once we've started using Super 301, 301 to get our way, uh, it's going to be very difficult to accept restraints on our own action. So as a great power, uh, and NGOs probably note this too, that if they can capture their own great power, they can probably get far quicker results you know, in terms of just results on some very narrowly defined specific outcomes. And what you're doing is an undermining the process of multilateral, multilateralism, which then gives you fairer outcomes and so on. But you see, this, is, this is, in my view, is a very short-run thing, very short-run way to do things, uh, because you may win specific battles this way and get, but in the end, people are going to react. Today, the EC, uh, I think there's going to be a, uh, an editorial in the Financial Times tomorrow, suggesting that the EC finally stand up and fight because unilateralism is breaking out here. Japan is already talking about uh, responding to unilateralism. I've already mentioned to you how NGOs in countries like India are beginning to break away from NGOs here because they see asymmetrical use of power. So ultimately, the main message that I have is that any, any, any changes we make should, should be not those which enable unilateral actions, uh, because that's a sh it looks wonderful in the short run, particularly for a great country. But it is a sure way of getting chaos in the system, a sense of unfairness going from us to them. And in fact, I mean, since I, as Chris Demuth said, I, I advise the Director General of the GATT now. And I was astonished because of our use of 301, particularly using GATT illegal methods of retaliation that many countries sort of now sort of privately think of us as a sort of Libya which tears up contracts uh, and that the value of our commitments is sort of sometimes doubted like on part of the Uruguay round is a 10-year elimination, 10-year process elimination of the multilateral, uh, of the multi-fiber agreement on textiles. But it's all end loaded quite deliberately to make it easier to take it through the Congress. And many ambassadors uh, from countries I won't name, uh, have told me that they don't, ex they don't think the Congress will honor that commitment uh, down the road because they'll just say it's, it's not something we can do, even though it's been signed. Now, that's the way we thought about <laughs> Libya and other countries, which said, you know, that, was, that contract was signed at a time, you know, which is different. Now it's, the situation is different. So I think unilateralism also has those dangers that the, the credibility of what we are doing uh, uh, by the promises that sort of begins to wear off. So I think the, for the m global warming and other processes, my own preference is to try and go for multilateral rules, even if it means some restraints on our capacity to get short-run advantage.
Yeah, if there are any more questions, I'll be happy to take them, yeah. Um, did I understand you to say you made comments on the microphone for a second? Yeah. Did I understand it to be said in the introduction that you were a card-carrying Clinton Democrat? <laughs> the, the, this introduction doesn't say it, but Chris Demuth <laughs> said it. And well, I am, I am. Okay. <clears throat> I've but I'm, I'm happy that I've misplaced the card these days. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, as far as trade policy is concerned. Gen generic question. Don't you think the Republicans are much better on this issue in terms of... On trade? Yes. Yes, I know. I agree. I agree. Oh. And I think what's, what's worrying me right now, I mean, it's not clear whether there's simple confusion and chaos in the administration on trade issues or whether some pattern is beginning to emerge. I was, my wife is a Soviet expert, and I was just telling some of my friends that we seem to have switched roles because... Yeah, I mean, she used to watch the Kremlin and see who sat next to whom and so on and so forth, and who was standing next to whom at the May Day Parade to see what policy was going to be. And, you know, we trade economists at a wonderful time. I mean, you know, everybody was transparent, at least in our country. And now it's exactly the other way. I mean, you know, Yels Yeltsin is quite transparent, probably too transparent. And we have to figure out by looking at those photographs of the economics meeting yesterday, you know, did Laura Tyson sit next to the <laughs> Benson or further down and so on, like who is important. <laughs> and, you know, the signals are all coming out thick and fast in different directions, but not, most of them are unhappy signals. Well, I just wanted to make sure I completely <laughs> understood you on that. <laughs> let me, since you rolled over on that one so nicely, let me ask you another question. <laughs> this is from a complete non-expert who just uh, goes very much over the surface of uh, trade policy. Do you think over the years that our policy towards Japan has been mishandled in the sense that we have not been sufficiently tough with them in terms of uh, getting parity? Do you think that, uh, or do you think that the prior administration was striking the right note there? Now you're touching on something where I have strong views. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think the, um, the Japan question is sort of grossly exaggerated in terms of the closeness of their markets. I mean, there are two issues. One is their exports, which is a traditional issue since the 1930s. Uh, they've never been allowed to trade freely. Anytime they were successful, we, you know, from the 30s on, we've imposed voluntary export restraints on them by saying that, you know, the predatory pricing, uh, the definition which was mainly that they were very successful exporters. So when Jim Fallow says, you know, they don't understand rules, they only go by quantities, I tell Jim, well, it's not because they're somehow incapable of thinking in terms of rules. Uh, I mean, I don't know the Japanese that well, uh, but I can't imagine anybody not being able to think in terms of rules. Uh, but we never allowed them to play by rules as far as exports were concerned. I mean, anybody who knows trade history knows uh, that that was so. And the MFA was also very largely a reflection uh, of uh, the yellow peril as far as textile exports were concerned. Those are the days of dollar blouses. And I also gather from some of my lawyer friends, I know lots of lawyers because you can't understand trade anymore without talking to lawyers, uh, I mean trade policy. And uh, apparently Warren Christopher was negotiating textile quotas in the early 60s. Uh, so we have got one more person who knows about trade uh, in the administration than you might imagine, but I would not want someone who was negotiating the quotas for the industry to be <laughs> necessarily in that position. But anyway, the point is um, that the Japanese on the export side have always had a problem from us. I, mean, I don't mean us, U.S. necessarily, but the whole world found it very difficult to accommodate Japanese exports. Japan was growing so fast, <clears throat> and the export advantage tends to be concentrated usually in a few sectors and it created endless problems of adjustment for industries outside in the West. It was like a giant in a Lilliputian economy, uh, and it was hard to accommodate Japan, and therefore this notion of unfair trade came up. Now it's gone over to their imports, because now it's a big, you know, big country, very successful. And that's a much harder one, because you see, if you look at, you have to distinguish between openness and penetrability. I mean, if you take, some, uh, I mean, you, the market is open, but it's harder to penetrate, according to most people who, you know, because they make the impossible. Uh, I mean, they, they're, you know, they're just not good enough to foreigners. I mean, they use Japanese in their own system, 
right, rather than English, making life difficult for us. Uh, <laughs> instead of having vertical integration, they have Keretsu's supply relationships. So if IBM makes its own chips, uh, nobody complains about that, right? I mean, about they're not opening the market for chips to, to, to third parties uh, like NEC or Hitachi. But uh, if uh, you have a, if IBM was broken down and had it, then those things being produced, chips being produced by somebody from whom he, they bought, then that would become a care. You know, carrots and supply relations would become terribly upset about it. But I think there are problems of getting into Japan because it was special. It was sort of largely isolated. Uh, it has not been colonized. So there are ways of doing business which require time to learn. And so there is a problem of penetration in that sense. I think for most people who want an easy way to get in, it is a problem. And so I think if you think of it from, as not an openness question, but really uh, being able to hack it very fast and successfully, do we have the patience? I think it's beginning to change dramatically. But a lot of the specific complaints are cockeyed, like the auto industry saying land values are very high. Well, I mean, so they can't uh, they have a, you know, pay a lot of money to set up a dealership. Well, there's nothing that prevents 10 guys from getting together and cutting into, into one-tenth of the cost. And besides, it's not even a fixed cost. It's a rental cost if you don't, you know. If, if they had, in fact, gone in with the land value <laughs> going up, they would have made a lot of money by just selling off those things, if not cars, and so on. So uh, it seems to me that if you look at each specific complaint, and there's a crescendo of complaints uh, against Japan, because once somebody's down and you're kicking them, uh, it'd be, it's so easy to f think of all kinds of things which you'd be ashamed of mentioning. You know, uh, you'd, you should really blush uh, at the kinds of arguments which people buy. So there is a problem, but it's not a, I don't think it is quite the way it's made out. And I think the Japanese are getting a bum rap. So I, my worry about the current, I mean, I think the, uh, the earlier administration, the Bush administration, was quite sensible, I think, about this whole issue. And so was the Reagan one. And, and the earlier ones, you know, and I think what's happening now is that a whole lot of people are getting onto this racket and trying to get, you know, guaranteed access to their markets and so on. Just, I, mean, I call it export protectionism. You know, if, if I get a protection in your market by saying you've got to buy 20% of my stuff, uh, that's the same thing as, you know, getting you to buy my stuff by having a, 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 a quota on imports. So there's import protectionism and export protectionism. But there is something. I'm not saying that's not entirely, but the, the, this hysteria which we have. I mean, it's very difficult for us to appreciate that fact because if you live out in the outside world, you automatically assume, <coughs> well, because you recognize it, there's a lot of anti-Americanism, right? But if you tell uh, somebody like Jim Fallows or particularly Pat Choate that there is anti-Japanism or whatever the word is, I mean, they think, they feel morally and mortally offended. But that's what it is. That's what it is. When you repeatedly, you know, go after some community or a nation and so on, and they can't do anything right. I mean, that's one of the definitions of prejudice. I don't know. If, if that's not, I don't know what is. It is not to say they're, they're angels. Nobody's an angel in this field. Sorry, long answer. <laughs> but it's a, it's a very important issue today. <laughs> Um, you were talking briefly, I want to go back to this issue of um, imposing ethical standards on yeah. others. And a I'm going to ask a question that really isn't an environmental question, it's a human rights question. Yeah. Um, it, you know, dolphins are easy for me. I don't wake up, I don't stay awake nights worrying about dolphins, but I do products that may have been produced by, you know, forced labor or something yeah. like that. You said something about the good moral values yeah. have intrinsic wait and will eventually win, but I mean, how long does that take? And I mean, will I, I, I don't have such a wonderful view of human nature that, um, so what, what can we do? Um, you know, when, you know, like abusive child labor practices or, I mean, really hard examples. No, I, th I think if you take abusive child labor or uh, that kind of practice, then I think you have to internationalize the issue by, uh, saying that that is something that bothers you. You can take it up through ILO. I mean, ILO follows these things. Uh, you can make it a matter for uh, negotiation, saying your foreign aid will be held up if you don't do it, right? 
So I, I think those are, or, or even on generalized, on GSP, preferential entry with Caribbean nations, we had that. I would say that is a special privilege being created, all right? So if, if you want a special privilege from me, which is in the nature of aid, uh, you better, you know, share my values, all right? And that sounds to me to be thoroughly reasonable. So in that context, I have no, no worries at all. Uh, I mean, in some, you know, where you are trying to use other instruments of policy to try and induce uh, people into things which, I think those human rights and things, you know, labor standards in the sense of abusing child labor, I think those are good, good causes, and I think most people would agree with you. But I think, again, you see, having a multilateral procedure to, or an impartial procedure where it's not just us who decide what's happening in Bangladesh, but the, the Bangla, you know, the, there is some scope for, uh, for different points of view to, to get at the truth of the matter. Uh, that, I think, is important, uh, because otherwise you don't get, again, uh, symmetry uh, or, or, or an impartial uh, examination, therefore acceptance. Like when we unilaterally went after the, if we had gone unilaterally after the EC on the oil seeds issue, where they were found, you know, by two impartial GATT panels to be in violation, uh, of our, you know, of their uh, obligation to, to open the oil seeds market. The fact that it was impartial, and twice we had found them uh, to be in violation, enabled us then to take action which was morally okay. So it was a triumph of multilateralism, not of in unilateralism. In the same way, if we really work through the ILO and, and then use our other sort of aid and other policies to convey a clear message like the Carter administration used to, I, I, I would be all in favor of it. I'd like to make one little teensy comment on that point. As a point, from the point of view of a businessman who uh, is in the middle of those arguments, um, there is sort of a basic inconsistency in uh, uh, those who are human rights advocates who on the one hand curse the companies for wanting to do business with the country at all and then want to sit on the other side of the negotiating table and trade points of market share for uh, improvements in human rights. <coughs> that is a problem. but. Um, on the basic premise that you put out, I really, uh, with regard to your remark about the Japanese, um, I really find the Japanese situation somewhat of an exaggeration of something that exists all over the world, and it is a, um, an underappreciation for the notion that exploiting markets, which is the word you used in the very beginning, is somewhat of an obsolete concept, that one doesn't uh, exploit markets or, or the, the number of cases where one can exploit a market in a trade sense have diminished to very, very few. And uh, to today, success in the marketplace is a combination of trade and uh, investment. Right. And uh, uh, many, many, many more instances we find that uh, the it is drawn by competition because the competition locally is much better. And uh, in order to have any meaningful market share or participation in the market rather than exploitation, you have to have a combination of those two. And the more you shift towards investment rather than trade, the, com the combination rather than a unilateral way of doing business, um, I think trade disputes take on a completely different uh, meaning. And, uh, uh, and, and participation in a market means participation in the environmental standards, it means participation in the labor standards, it means participation in, uh, in the uh, monetary standards and choices that are being made by the country where you are dealing. Um, so I, I think your, your, your point about the Japanese is right. The Japan however, the Japanese practices can sometimes be uh, exceedingly irritating in scope and therefore uh, and the pace is a little slower than most uh, uh, yanks are willing yeah, to agree. accept so yeah no i think you're right on that yes um this one here yeah. i want to raise a domestic perhaps more environmental issue and that is domestically it seems to me that there are three primary ways of uh, financing the cost of cleaning up a jurisdiction that has become polluted. One is, of course, from general tax revenues, which has political right. problems. Um, the second is sort of what we do now, a post hoc assigning of blame to uh, raise the, uh, the money in order to, do it, to finance a cleanup. That has its own problems, companies that have gone away, assigning blame 20, 30, 40 years after the fact. And the third is uh, direct taxation of products which have created the, uh, the problem. Now that gets a little bit into the sort of process of how they're made, which you touched on. 
Uh, now, you said that particularly the latter two, which in each case would raise the price of the products, uh, um, that they would not be a problem <coughs> under GATT if they were treated equally. Um, and of course, in the second context, I suppose, you, what you have to do is if you're going to uh, tax an American company that has made a particular chemical, if you don't then impose that tax on a foreign company that makes that chemical, then you're basically destroying the American industry, which has its own problems. But the question is whether you have a view on the best way to finance a cleanup and what the trade implications are of the latter two options, particularly it, one, number one, the post hoc imposition on particular industries of the cost of cleanup or the ta direct taxation of products which the manufacturer of which have uh, caused the, uh, the pollution problem. But if the industry is creating the products, I mean, it, it's just the same thing, isn't it? I'm, I'm missing the distinction between the last two. You mean a generalized tax on, on, on all kinds of commodities, or a general tax to pay for that cleanup well, of a specific industry well, as against taxing that specific industry? Well, all right, let me see if I can articulate the difference between yeah. the two. One is saying, okay, DuPont, you've been around for 20 years. Right. You've got to pay X hundreds of millions of dollars to clean up. Then, of course, the, cost, the, of du right. Right. the cost of DuPont's products would be very expensive. Sure. And they would be made uh, non-competitive vis-a-vis <coughs> foreign companies that are just entering, which do not have this pollution experience. Okay. Uh, it seems to me that you know, there's a, 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 tr a necessity there right. to then somehow equalize but you DuPont see, yeah. vis a vis Okay, okay that's mean. one. The second uh, is that you just take every product. Yeah, yeah, I understand now your question. But it seems to me that uh, there's no th good theoretical basis. I see uh, some environmental experts here. Um, but there's no theoretical basis for the past damage that you may have done, for, because that's a fixed cost, for taxing that specific industry, right? I mean, that's come and gone. And it's, in fact, even, it might even be unfair, because at that time, we didn't even know that there was such a, you know, that what we were doing was going to harm anybody. This, this argument bears on the poor countries complain that most of the environment has been damaged already <laughs> by you people, therefore you should pay for everything. Uh, I mean, that's a stock argument, right? Past, uh, well, that really, you know, that raises Nozick-like objections. Now, you know, did, were people aware at that time that they were exploiting the commons or, or you know, over-exploiting them? Because nobody even knew about it. And who on earth knew that, you know, just sh ozone layer, you know, would be disrupted by these little aerosol sprays? Uh, I mean, that, that sounds like science fiction even to me. Even today, it sounds like science fiction to me. I still can't understand how that's happening. Uh, but, you know, that's what science tells you, that you know, every tiny little micro act like that endangers the human race. But so, if it's a past phenomenon, it's like what we economists call a fixed cost. And therefore, the way you design a tax system, right, I mean, it should be, uh, should have nothing to do <laughs> with what went before. And I was giving a moral philosophical and an economic argument for ignoring who did what earlier. So I, I would be in favor of designing a tax system which really pays attention to efficiency uh, right within the system, which would be a coupon system or a generalized tax system. But those are the kinds of issues you would want to deal with in terms of design. Uh, of these, but these also in turn, remember, will raise income distributional issues. I mean, if somebody buys a per permit to pollute Lake Michigan and then nobody buys that uh, permit in, in New York, New York is going to get cleaner and Lake Michigan <laughs> is going to get worse. And this question was actually in the newspapers uh, last week or something. So you need additional policy instruments to reflect uh, those additional distributional considerations. So an efficient solution is not necessarily a distributionally acceptable solution for people. And I think you're seeing that in the domestic context very much these days. Yeah. I just wanted to ask a question without making a statement, if that's OK. Sure. <laughs> Would you please Make it uh, rhetorical. <laughs> Would you please give us your view on the, on the success of the Uruguay round, wh whether it will be greened, and whether there will be uh, a green round of negotiations? On the gap. Well, that, that raises uh, this whole issue of, you know, sort of figuring out what the administration is up to. I mean, most of us feel who've been in the round, um, you know, into trade policy for some time now, feel that 
this is an issue that cannot be accommodated now because I gave you some sense of the kinds of issues that come up, all of which are going to involve accommodation, craftsmanship, compromises. You know, uh, and there are very difficult issues. I mean, I made them sound simple, <laughs> but they are very difficult issues to negotiate. And you will have to negotiate them. Now, if you say, look, we because we've just discovered these and because the environmental lobbyists, and I don't mean in a pejorative sense, I mean you know, people are concerned about the environment, are in fact very concerned about the specific rules they find in the Dunkel text and in the negotiated agreement uh, and in the existing GATT and the, you know, and the prospective changes in it, that therefore it should all be rewritten now uh, has two problems with it. One is that it is simply reflects lack of uh, knowledge about what GATT does. GATT is continuously being changed by new rounds of negotiations. I mean, anti-dumping, subsidies, procurement code, everything. And nothing is set in cement. It's sort of, it's concluded at one stage, then a whole lot of protections try and open it up. Uh, a lot of good people like us <laughs> try and change it the other way. Countries negotiate and changes happen. So this is a continuous change process, but round after round. And depending on how governments change, I mean, the Clinton administration is, is very different from what has gone on under any administration before, in my view, on trade policy. Now, who would have, you know, they're bound to open up new questions. I mean, they're, they're already doing that implicitly. So I think environmentalists are too worried because they don't know this. They think everything is set in cement. And you know it's going to be with them till 3000 AD, uh, and that's you know it's, it's simply a matter of educating them that look the next round will do it, uh, and will make the next round uh, environment competition policy all the sort of major issues which have come up, and which people are worried about. Um, the second thing is if you may say look no I, I won't take that and I'll continue negotiating and introducing these new issues which are very complex then you're going to have continuous negotiations. Now, in principle, I wouldn't mind it too much if the world was, you know, fashioned after what I would like it to be. <laughs> but today, everybody says this is the Uruguay round has entered its seventh year. And that's somehow like, you know, it's gone on for a thousand years or something. You know, it's just broken down and so on and so forth. Nobody looks at NAFTA, which we began 10 years ago. And we are still negotiating with Salinas, right? I mean, we're, we're going to reopen a few issues. So just three countries, one continent, or sub, I don't know, it's not subcontinent, but it is a sort of less than a continent, uh, North America, just integrating that uh, uh, is taking more than 10 years. EC started in 57, and we are still into 1992, and they still have car quotas on each other and lots of other obstacles. They're still unifying the market. Nobody thinks of it as a protracted process. But the seventh year of Uruguay round negotiation, that shows it's not working, right? It's not working. I mean, you just catch any person on <laughs> in Washington, they'll say it's not working, all right? That's the perception. So if it was a normal world, well-informed, no, it is a normal world, but ill-informed. But if, if you had a well-informed world, someone who, people who really studied these issues, and then saw that seven years is not a hell of a lot of time when you're dealing with so many issues and so many countries, and it's really amazing how much has been achieved. If you're willing to buy that, I wouldn't mind another year, or two years for that matter. But that's not the way people are looking at it. Immediately, people are rushing into saying, if you pro 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 prolong it any further, it's failed. I mean, that's the way. So you will wound the GATT. You will certainly, uh, I think, kill the multilateral system in which Many of my students don't, I mean, I think our generation was very different. Uh, the young generation is results oriented. I don't think there's any economist today in the earlier, you know, you know less, less than 40, who has a feel for multilateralism. I mean, when we were, when we think about results, we, 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 for the same results, if you arrive at one, th the same result from a multilateral process, we derive utility, additional utility, all right, as against, beating somebody else down to achieve that same result. So it's what, what Roy Harrod used to call process utilitarianism, as against just simply consequential utilitarianism. So they're all my students, most of them who, who, who've been hired, right? None of them have a feel, because none of them have a vision. They're technical people at best. And they do not have that ability to sit back
look beyond the technical consequences of what they're doing. So it's a very different generation, I feel, and, and the politicians, because of the worries about Japan, it's a mirror that, and therefore you've got a very unhealthy combination, uh, it seems to me, where people will take quick fixes, you know, indulge their sort of worries and become very panicky, petulant, whatever. You know, everything will combine to, to, to have people really not go that route, and therefore people will break out into Super 301, 301. Super 301 is part of the Clinton agenda. And Laura Tyson wants it, Lloyd Benson wants it, everybody wants it. So, I mean, you know, it's going to come in some form unless, unless uh, the foreign big powers say we're not going to stand for it. So, I mean, I have changed my view. I'm simply appealing to good sense. It's not going to work, in my view. You really have to stand up. Uh, and stop it, uh, which, which th only the big powers can do, and say, look, you've got to have a, a symmetric process, a fair process, right? If you're wrong, let it be established through a proper process, right? Preferably an impartial one. Not that we are angels. We are wrong in many cases, like you are wrong in some cases, and let's, let's sort it out. But we have to have proper procedures. We cannot proceed unilaterally. Um, but that is the mood right now, because people are not worried about People don't care about multilateral, and they could say, "Go to you know, multilateralism can go to pieces for all all I care." You know, I'm going to strike special deals for my sector, for specific countries, and so on and so forth. So that is the mood today. So this is why I feel I urge all my environmentalist friends. I hope there are many <laughs> to um, to really not push the unilateral line, not push the don't settle the round line, but really ask for a new round. Uh, closing this one, putting their weight behind, because I think Clinton, to some extent, Clinton is going to respond to special interests, no question. They're friends of the campaign. Uh, and he's going to have to respond through Gore, probably, to the environmental interest, which is a general interest in which one probably would want to respond to. So he's going to be in a pencil like movement, all of them opposing the closing of the round quickly, the special interest, because they want that last ounce of flesh from you know, for their specific sector. The, gen the environmentalists, because they really don't understand the, you know, what's, what's involved here and what is the cost of prolonging the process further. Thank you. Judge, thank you very much.